Chapter Number One of Love Insurance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Love Insurance by Earl Dare Biggers. Chapter One: A Sporting Proposition. Outside a gilt-lettered door on the 17th floor of a New York office building, a tall young man in a fur-lined coat stood shivering. Why did he shiver in that coat? He shivered because he was fussed, poor chap, because he was rattled from the soles of his custom-made boots to the apex of his Piccadilly hat. A painful, palpitating spectacle he stood. Meanwhile, on the other side of the door, the business of the American branch of that famous marine insurance firm, Lloyd's of London, usually termed in magazine articles, the greatest gambling institution in the world, went on oblivious to the shiverer who approached. The shiverer with a nervous movement, shifted his walking stick to his left hand and laid his right on the doorknob. Though he is not at his best, let us take a look at him. Tall, as has been noted, perfectly garbed after London's taste, mild and blue as to eye, blonde as to hair. A handsome, if somewhat weak face, very distinguished, even aristocratic, in appearance. Perhaps the thrill for us democratics here of the nobility. And at this moment, sadly in need of a generous dose of that courage that abounds, see any book of familiar quotations, on the playing fields of Eton utterly destitute of the Eaton or any other brand, he pushed open the door. The click of two dozen American typewriters smote upon his hearing. An office boy of the dominant New York race demanded in loud, indiscreet tones his business there. My business, said the tall young man weakly, is with Lloyd's of London. Wandered off down that stenographer bordered lane. In a moment he was back. Mr. Thackerell, see you, he announced. He followed the boy to the tall young man. His courage began to return. Why not? One of his ancestors, graduate of those playing fields, had fought at Waterloo. Mr. Thacker sat in plump and genial prosperity before a polished flat-top desk. Opposite him, at a desk equally polished, sat an even more polished young American of capable bearing. For an embarrassed moment, the tall youth in fur stood looking from one to the other. Then Mr. Thacker spoke. You have business with Lloyd's? The tall young man blushed. I, I hope to have, yes. There was in his speech that faint suggestion of a lisp that marks many of the well-born of his race. Perhaps it is the golden spoon in their mouths, interfering a bit with their diction. What can we do for you? Mr. Thacker was cold and matter-of-fact, like a card index. Steadily through each week he grew more businesslike, and this was Saturday morning. The visitor performed a shaky but remarkable juggling feat with his walking stick. I, well, I, he stammered. Oh, come, come, thought Mr. Thacker impatiently. Well, said the tall young man desperately. Perhaps it would be best for me to make myself known at once. I am Alan, Lord Harrowby, son and heir 
of James Nelson Harrowby, Earl of Raybrook. And I, I have come here. The younger of the Americans spoke in more kindly fashion. You have a proposition to make to Lloyd's? Exactly, said Lord Harrowby, and sank with a sigh of relief into a chair, as though that concluded his portion of the entertainment. Let's hear it, boomed the relentless Thacker. Lord Harrowby writhed in his chair. I am sure you will pardon me, he said, if I preface my, er, proposition with the statement that it is utterly fantastic. And if I add also that it should be known to the fewest possible number. Mr. Thacker waved his hand across the gleaming surfaces of two desks. This is my assistant manager, Mr. Richard Minnett, he announced. Mr. Minnett, you must know, is in on all the secrets of the firm. Now let's have it. I am right. Am I not, his lordship continued, in the assumption that Lloyd's frequently takes rather unusual risks? Lloyd's, answered Mr. Thacker, is chiefly concerned with the fortunes of those who go down to, and sometimes down into, the sea in ships. However, there are a number of non-marine underwriters connected with these men have been known to risk their money on pretty giddy chances. It's all done in the name of Lloyd's, though the firm is not financially responsible. Lord Harrowby got quickly to his feet. Then it would be better, he said, relieved, for me to take my proposition to one of these non-marine underwriters. Mr. Thacker frowned. Curiosity agitated his bosom. You'd have to go to London to do that, he remarked. Better give us an inkling of what's on your mind. His lordship tapped uneasily at the base of Mr. Thacker's desk with a stick. If you will pardon me, I'd rather not, he said. Oh, very well, sighed Mr. Thacker. How about Owen Jeffson? asked Mr. Minnett suddenly. Overjoyed, Mr. Thacker started up. Pie gad, I forgot about Jeffson. Sails at one o'clock, doesn't he? He turned to Lord Harrowby. The very man, and in New York, too. Jeffson would insure T. Roosevelt against another cup of coffee. Am I to understand, asked Harrowby, that Jeffson is the man for me to see? Exactly, beamed Mr. Thacker. I'll have him here in fifteen minutes. Richard, will you please call up his hotel? And as Mr. Minnett reached for his telephone, Mr. Thacker added pleadingly, Of course, I don't know the nature of your proposition. No, agreed Lord Harrowby politely. Discouraged, Mr. Thacker gave up. However, Jeffson seems to have a gambling streak in him that odd risks appeal to, he went on. Of course, he's scientific. At Lloyd's, risks are scientifically investigated. But occasionally, well, Jeffson insured Sir Christopher Conway, KCB, against the arrival of twins in his family. Perhaps you recall the litigation that resulted when triplets put in their appearance? I'm sorry to say I do not, said Lord Harrowby. Mr. Minnett sat down the telephone. Owen Jeffson is on his way here in a taxi, he announced. Good old Jeffson, mused Mr. Thacker, reminiscent. Why, some of the man's risks are famous. Take that shopkeeper in the Strand. Every day at noon, the shadow of Nelson's monument in Trafalgar Square 
falls across his door. Twenty years ago, he got to worrying for fear that statue would fall someday and smash his shop. And every year since, he has taken out a policy with Jeffson, insuring him against that dreadful contingency. I seem to have heard of that, admitted Harrowby, with the ghost of a smile. You must have. Only recently, Jeffson wrote a policy for the Dowager Duchess of Tremaine, insuring her against the unhappy event of a rainstorm, spoiling the garden party she is shortly to give at her Italian villa. I understand a small fortune is involved. Then there is Courtney Giles, leading man at the West End Road Theater. He fears obesity. Jeffson has insured him. Should he become too plump for Romeo roles, Lloyd's, or rather Jeffson, will owe him a large sum of money. I am encouraged to hope, remarked Lord Harrowby, that Mr. Jeffson will listen to my proposition. No doubt he will, replied Mr. Thacker. I can't say definitely. Now, if I knew the nature, but when Mr. Jeffson walked into the office fifteen minutes later, Mr. Thacker was still lamentably ignorant of the nature of his titled visitor's business. Mr. Jeffson was a small, wiry man, crowned by a vast acreage of bald head, and with the immobile countenance sometimes lovingly known as a he could watch the rain pour in torrents on the Dowager Duchess. Courtney Giles' waist expand visibly before his eyes. The statue of Nelson totter and fall on his shopkeeper and never move a muscle of that face. I am delighted to meet your lordship, said he to Harrowby. Knew your father, the Earl, very well at one time had business dealings with him, often. A man after my own heart, always ready to take a risk. I trust you left him well? Quite, thank you, Lord Harrowby answered, although he will insist on playing polo. At his age, eighty-two, it is a dangerous sport. Mr. Jensen smiled. Still taking chances, he said. A splendid old gentleman. I understand that you, Lord Harrowby, have a proposition to make to me as an underwriter in Lloyd's. They sat down. Alas, if Mr. Burke, who compiled the well-known peerage, could have seen Lord Harrowby then, what distress would have been his for a most unlordly flush? again mantled that British cheek. A nobleman was supremely rattled. I will try and explain, said his lordship, gulping a plebeian gulp. My affairs have been for some time in rather a chaotic state. Idleness, the life of the town, you gentlemen will understand. Naturally, it has been suggested to me that I exchange my name and title for the millions of some American heiress. I have always violently objected to any such plan. I, I couldn't quite bring myself to do any such low trick as that. And then, a few months ago on the continent, I met a girl. He paused. I'm not a clever chap, really, he went on. I'm afraid I cannot describe her to you. Spirited, charming, he looked toward the youngest of the trio. You at least understand, he finished. Mr. Minnick leaned back in his chair and smiled a most engaging smile. Perfectly, he said. Thank you, went on Lord Harrowby. 
in all seriousness. It was only incidental, quite irrelevant, that this young woman happened to be very wealthy. I fell desperately in love. I am still in that, er, pleasing state. The young lady's name, gentlemen, is Cynthia Merrick. She is the daughter of Spencer Merrick, whose fortune has, I believe, been accumulated in oil. Mr. Thacker's eyebrows rose respectfully. A week from next Tuesday, said Lord Harrowby solemnly, at San Marco, on the east coast of Florida, this young woman and I are to be married. And what, asked Owen Jeffson, is your proposition? Lord Harrowby shifted nervously in his chair. I say we are to be married, he continued, but are we? That is the nightmare that haunts me. A slip, my, er, creditors, coming down on me, and, far more important, the dreadful agony of losing the dearest woman in the world. What could happen? Mr. Jeffson wanted to know. Did I say the young woman was vivacious? inquired Lord Harrowby. She is a thousand girls in one. Some untoward happening, and she might change her mind in a flash. Silence within the room. Outside, the roar of New York and the clatter of the inevitable riveting machine making its points relentlessly. That, said Lord Harrowby slowly, is what I wish you to insure me against, Mr. Jeffson. You mean, I mean, the awful possibility of Miss Cynthia Merrick's changing her mind. Again, silence, save for the riveting machine outside, and three men looking unbelievably at one another. Of course, his lordship went on hastily, it is understood that I personally am very eager for this wedding to take place. It is understood that in the interval before the ceremony, I shall do all in my power to keep Miss Merrick to her present intention. Should the marriage be abandoned because of any act of mine, I would be ready to forfeit all claims on Lloyd's. Mr. Thacker recovered his breath and his voice at one and the same time. Preposterous, he snorted, begging your lordship's pardon. You cannot expect hard-headed businessmen to listen seriously to any such proposition as that. Tushery, sir, tushery. Speaking as the American representative of Lloyd's... One moment, interrupted Mr. Jeffson. In his eyes shone a queer light, a light such as one might expect to find in the eyes of Peter Pan, the boy who never grew up. One moment, please. What song had you in mind, Lord Harrowby? Well, say one hundred thousand pounds, suggested his lordship. I realize that my proposition is fantastic. I really admit it as but one hundred thousand pounds, Mr. Jeffson repeated it thoughtfully. I should have to charge your lordship a rather high rate, as high as ten percent. Lord Harrowby seemed to be in the throes of mental arithmetic. I am afraid, he said finally, I could not afford one hundred thousand at that rate, but I could afford Seventy-five thousand? Would that be satisfactory, Mr. Jeffson? Jeffson, cried Mr. Thacker wildly, are you mad? Do you realize? I realize everything, Thacker, said Jeffson calmly. I have your lordship's word that the young lady is at present determined on this alliance, and that you will do all in your power to keep her to her intention? You have my word, 
said Lord Harrowby. If you should care to telegraph me, your word is sufficient, said Jeffson. Mr. Bennet, will you be kind enough to bring me a policy blank? See here, Jeffson, foamed Thacker. What if this thing should get into the newspapers? We'd be the laughing stock of the business world. It mustn't, said Jeffson coolly. It might, roared Thacker. Mr. Minnett arrived with a blank policy, and Mr. Jeffson sat down at the young man's desk. One minute, said Thacker. The faith of you two gentlemen in each other is touching, but I take it the millennium is still a few years off. He drew toward him a blank sheet of paper and wrote, I want this thing done in a business-like way, if it's to be done in my office. He handed the sheet of paper to Lord Harrowby. Will you read that, please, he said. Certainly, his lordship read. I hereby agree that in the interval until my wedding with Miss Cynthia Merrick, next Tuesday week, I will do all in my power to put through the match, and that should the wedding be called off through any subsequent direct act of mine, I will forfeit all claims on Lloyd's. Will you sign that, please? requested Mr. Thacker. With pleasure, his lordship reached for a pen. You and I, Richard, said Mr. Thacker, will sign as witnesses. Now, Jeffson, go ahead with your fool policy. Mr. Jeffson looked up thoughtfully. Shall I say, your lordship, he asked, that if two weeks from today the wedding has not taken place and has absolutely no prospect of taking place, I owe you seventy-five thousand pounds? Yes, his lordship nodded, provided, of course, I have not forfeited by reason of this agreement. I shall write you a check, Mr. Jeffson. For a time there was no sound in the room save the scratching of two pens, while Mr. Thacker gazed open-mouthed at Mr. Minnett, and Mr. Minnett light-heartedly smiled back. Then Mr. Jeffson reached for a blotter. I shall attend to the London end of this when I reach there five days hence, he said. Perhaps I can find another underwriter to share the risk with me. The transaction was completed, and his lordship rose to go. I am at the plaza, he said, if any difficulty should arise. But I sail tonight for San Marco, on the yacht of a friend. He crossed over and took Mr. Jeffson's hand. I can only hope, with all my heart, he finished feelingly, that you never have to pay this policy. We're with your lordship there, said Mr. Thacker sharply. Ah, uh, you have been very kind, replied Lord Harrowby. I wish you all good day. And, shivering no longer, he went away in his fine fur coat. As the door closed upon the nobleman, Mr. Thacker turned explosively on his friend from overseas. Jeffson, he thundered, you're an idiot, a rank, unmitigated idiot. The Peter Pan light was bright in Jeffson's eyes. So new, he half whispered. So original. Bless the boy's heart. I've been waiting forty years for a proposition like that. Do you realize, Thacker cried, that seventy-five thousand pounds of your good money depends on the honor of Lord Harrowby? I do, returned Jeffson. And I would not be concerned if it were ten times that sum. I know the breed. Why, once, and you, Thacker, would have called me an idiot on that occasion, too. I insured his father against the loss of a polo game by a team on which the Earl was playing. And he played like the devil, the Earl did, won the game himself. Ah, I know the breed. Oh well, sighed Thacker, I won't argue 
But one thing is certain, Jeffson. You can't go back to England now. Your place is in San Marco with one hand on the rope that rings the wedding bells. Jeffson shook his great bald head. No, he said. I must return today. It is absolutely necessary. My interests in San Marco are in the hands of Providence. Mr. Thacker walked the floor wildly. Providence needs help in handling a woman, he protested. Miss Merrick must not change her mind. Someone must see that she doesn't. If you can't go yourself, he paused reflecting, some young man, active, capable. Mr. Richard Minnett had risen from his chair and was moving softly towards his overcoat. Looking over his shoulder, he beheld Mr. Thacker's keen eyes upon him. Just going out to lunch, he said guiltily. Sit down, Richard, remarked Mr. Thacker with decision. Mr. Minnett sat, the dread of something impending in his heart. Jeffson, said Mr. Thacker, this boy here is the son of a man whom I was very fond of. His father left him the means to squander his life on clubs and cocktails that he had chosen, but he picked out a business career instead. Five years ago, I took him into this office, and he has repaid me by faithful, even brilliant, service. I would trust him with, well, I'd trust him as far as you'd trust a member of your own peerage. Yes? said Mr. Jeffson. Mr. Thacker wheeled dramatically and faced his young assistant. Richard, he ordered, go to San Marco. Go to San Marco and see to it that Miss Cynthia Merrick does not change her mind. A gone feeling shot through Mr. Minnett in the vicinity of his stomach. It was possible that he really needed that lunch. Yes, sir, he said faintly. Of course, it's up to me to do anything you say. If you insist, I'll go, but... But what, Richard? Isn't it a rather big order? Women? Aren't they like an, uh, April afternoon or something of that sort? It seems to me I've read they were in books snorted Mr. Thacker. Is your knowledge of the ways of woman confined to books? A close observer might have noted the ghost of a smile in Mr. Minnett's clear blue eyes. In part, it is, he admitted. And then again, in part, it isn't. Well, put away your books, my boy, said Mr. Thacker. A nice, Instructive little vacation has fallen on you from heaven. Mad old Jeffson here must be saved from himself. That wedding must take place, positively, rain or shine. I trust you to see that it does, Richard. Mr. Minnett rose and stepped over to his hat and coat. I'm off for San Marco, he announced blithely. His lips were firm but smiling. The land of sunshine and flowers and orange blossoms, or I know the reason why. Jeffson trusts Harrowby, said Mr. Thacker. All very well, but just the same, if I were you, I'd be aboard that yacht tonight when it leaves New York Harbor, invited or uninvited. I must ask, put in Mr. Jeffson hurriedly, that you do nothing to embarrass Lord Harrowby in any way. No, said Thacker, but keep an eye on him, my boy. A keen and busy eye. I will, agreed Mr. Minnett. Do I look like Cupid, gentlemen? No? Ah, it's the overcoat. Well, I'll get rid of that in Florida. I'll say goodbye. He shook hands with Jeffson and with Thacker. Goodbye, Richard, said the latter, 
I'm really fond of old Jeffson here. He's been my friend in need. He mustn't lose. I trust you, my boy. I won't disappoint you, Dick Minnett promised. A look of seriousness flashed across his face. Miss Cynthia Merrick changes her mind only over my dead body. He paused for a second at the door, and his eyes grew suddenly thoughtful. I wonder what she's like, he murmured. Then, with a smile toward the two men left behind, he went out and down that stenographer-bordered lane to San Marco. End of Chapter One Recording by Linda Andrus